Hello and welcome to episode 7 of Shark Talk, where I chat with former Royal Marine Commando, wildlife conservationist and TV presenter James Glancy. James will be telling us all about his time being shark wrecked for Discovery Channel, not once but twice. He'll also be offering some really unique, interesting insights into not just shark diving, but military diving too. And he'll be discussing some of Britain's most lovable sharks. It's all coming up right here on Shark Talk. James, thank you for joining me on Shark Talk to spend an afternoon geeking out about sharks. Gemma, thanks for having me on. I love being involved with anyone who has a passion for sharks. So to speak to a fellow shark lover as we come out of lockdown is amazing. Now, James, you have a, a very impressive and interesting resume, it has to be said. Former Royal Marine Commando, recipient of the uh, Conspicuous Gallantry Cross, no less, um, and now conservationist and TV presenter. So a very colourful life that you've led <laughs> so far. <laughs> I, I like to be out and about. And, you know, the most amazing thing about being in conservation and even talking about sharks is this whole journey began with my first shark dive. When I learned to dive, did my paddy course, age 13, going on to 14, um, with my dad. And it was on those first few dives, I saw sharks. And when I got home, I just bought shark books. And all I did was, that all I did as a kid was look at shark books and dinosaur books. But also uh, the instructor, one of them had been a Navy SEAL. So in my, my head at 14 years old, I just thought to myself, one day I want to be a shark diver who has been in the military so I can tell everyone when I'm on the diving boat that I used to be a British Navy SEAL. <laughs> it's actually happened. That's mad. That, and the level of detail that that's manifested itself, you know, the sharks and the Royal Marines, and that's incredible. Did you, in a way, put all your shark interactions on pause while you were in the military and, and, and working overseas? I mean, that's, that's an interesting one because you know, when you... The, the military isn't a job, it's a lifestyle. And I, uh, I got sponsored through university. And when, when I was at uni, 9-11 happened, which was just a complete, not just a game changer in my life, but, you know, the history of the world to, to, to a major extent. So when I finished uni, I went straight out to Afghanistan. In between those combat tours, we'd often do, um, you know, you'd have a bit of period of time out. And I, I used the system um, to further my diving skills. So I did all my, my rescue diver, um, BZAC sports diver. Um, I actually led a diving expedition straight out to Haggada, to, to the Red Sea, to do some more diving. So throughout, I was diving. And then and then when I um, had my career, uh, to the latter part of it in the, in the Special Forces, we're trained as combat divers. So that just increased my ability to operate underwater in very challenging environments. After 10 years, I'd had enough of being in the military um, and that's where I made the move uh, to Civvy Street and, and into conservation. But those skill sets I've developed, whether it's planning an expedition, working in a difficult environment, but particularly underwater at night at very tough diving conditions, they have proven really useful for both conservation and then getting involved in what I call conservation communication, but television, um, telling an exciting story about wildlife um, and, the, and the environment. So it's kind of ebbed and flowed but I never stopped diving when I was in the military. I know that you've said you've been involved in lots of uh, TV shows and one which we will talk about is uh, one of the Shark Week episodes. Well there's been two editions of this, Shark Wrecked, which is a very interesting premise isn't it because it's it's mimicking real life situations and telling stories that you normally don't get to see from the, the victim's point of view, I suppose. Can you tell us about that? Tell us how it came about. Yeah. And In this case, I had this great idea about an, an environmental show, which would be based on the oceanic white tip, which is, was the most abundant shark in the sea. And the the most famous story of a shark attack, or a, shark, a series of shark attacks at sea, is the, the sinking of the USS Indianapolis, which actually um, fed the creation of Jaws, um, it inspired the, the Jaws movie. So to recap, the USS Indianapolis was sunk by a Japanese um, torpedo boat. And a lot of the sailors ended up in the water and were likely, most of them drowned, died of hypothermia. Some were taken by oceanic white tips, potentially tiger sharks. 
before Paul Allen, the founder of Microsoft um, and Vulcan, died, he found the USS Indianapolis, he found the location. So it gave me an idea, why don't we go back and do an experiment in the water by putting people in the water, myself included, to see how many sharks actually turn up. Because in 1945, loads would have turned up. I mean, this species had declined by more than 98%. So I wanted to show a sort of survival story and what it'd be like to be in the water and show actually sharks are not the threat. It's the water, it's the hypothermia. Um, that's the real threat to humans, not sharks. Before we discuss a little bit more about that show, I just want to highlight that stat that you mentioned there. The decline of 98% of oceanic white tips. That's devastating. So research is so difficult to do on um, any marine species, but um, the, that statistic of between 98 and 99% decline in oceanic white tips is, is specific to the Gulf of Mexico. But I think they believe that's the same in the Pacific, the Indian Ocean, um, and the Atlantic. I mean, it's one of the most um, widely uh, roaming species of shark. Um, and the reason is, is that they're very susceptible to all the types of fishing from the legal and illegal fishing industry, but particularly longline vessels, which have been hitting them really hard. So they, they are targeted for a variety of things, for their meat, um, of course, we know about the, the finning industry. Um, even their skin is used, and of course, sometimes even their teeth for jewellery. But it's mainly, it, it was traditionally for their shark fins. Now it's meat as well. And of course, they get caught as bycatch. So, mm. you know, this is one species that was has gone from massive ad abundance to a dramatic decline. And they're amazing, amazing sharks, incredibly graceful, beautiful. But you've been swimming with them uh, in a potentially dangerous environment. So tell us, you know, tell us what that experience was like and how, how your perceptions changed or didn't change based on that. I was I was pretty concerned. I'd not, uh, I, I swam with a real variety of sharks, but I hadn't and spent much time with oceanic white tips. And this is, again, goes back to the problem of perception. They do have a bad um, reputation as being sort of the wolves of the sea, being the shark species that cleans up shark wrecks and takes all the survivors. Um, we will, in the end, we did the experiment off the Bahamas, um, off Cat Island, because there's a, a, a decent population of oceanic white tips. They wouldn't let us film in the in the Pacific because they were so worried of sharks not turning up and then not being hmm. a show. As it was, um, we did, uh, Paul de Gelder and I, Paul lost his leg and arm in a shark attack, from a bull, uh, a bull shark attack. But they got us in the water in the Atlantic for just well, for two days. So we spent two days in the water through all sorts of storms and horrendous conditions. And the way we worked it was in the daytime, we were just out in the open water. And at nighttime, we had this pen, not a cage, open top, with cricket nets or baseball nets around the side of it um, and a sort of a, a metallic structure. So we were in there. We, uh, it was just crazy because at night time, no one knew how they re would react to having essentially this net there. Mm. And uh, it was on the second night, we actually got bumped by this massive oceanic white tip. They are super curious. But what I learned was that um, as long as you're fit and you can see them, they leave you alone. You know that they what they're looking for is wounded fish or something that's wounded or dead. They don't want to take any risks at all. So they will come close to you, and you can gently push them away, and they're absolutely no risk. As soon as, as soon as you start trying to sleep or it gets the tables turn at night time when you can't see them, that's what when, that's when these predators really just turn on like a light bulb. They they go from being quite docile into this predatory mode. Um, which is why we always advise, you know, don't go swimming at dusk or at night. Um, and it was a very visible difference between the daytime with the oceanic white tips, which is just one of the best experiences I've ever had with 12 swimming around me. Wow. At nighttime, they're a different, they're a different animal. But what I can tell you is that it's absolutely horrendous just being at sea because when you're down at that, at that level, you can, you can see very little around you. Um, and you do, you do get sick. Um, just, just you get motion sickness. But the worst thing is just the continual splashing of salt water. It's more of an experiment to see what happens to your body in salt water. 
than it was what happens with sharks. Mm. Um, but, you know, they were there all the time, the oceanic white tips. And I imagine it was an experiment to see what happens in your mind as well, especially when you're getting fatigued and you can't concentrate and keep that level of awareness that you know you need to, to, to be safe. Although talking to you, you're probably very trained in these kind of mental stamina. We, we, we get trained in all sorts of survival, evasion, um, and, you know, uh, interrogation training techniques. And so, and I've been through some punishing ordeals. The one thing doing a, 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 show, a TV show that, that is, is difficult is, um, you know, they, they were not obviously not willing to make it a, um, a faked experiment. They wanted us to be in the water. But at the same time, they still want to get lines off of you. So, you know, you're in the water. They're saying, can you just say something about this or just tell us how you're feeling? And at times you just say, you just want them to go away. And there is one incident where, you know, I did, did tell the, uh, the medic just to, to do <laughs> one because, you know, at sort of 3 a.m. when they're coming to the medical check to make sure you're, you're okay and they're shining lights at you, you're just in this survival mode. You know, and after a while, not only are you getting annoyed with the crew, Paul and I start, you know, having little little disputes. And, you know, you run out of things to talk about. You don't want to talk to each other. But survival is about working together as a team. Um, and because he'd been in the Australian Army and Navy, and I spent a lot of um, time in the Marines, um, we knew, you know, to let those little disputes go uh, and to work together. Um, and, and actually, there, there came a point on the second evening um, as dusk came, they decided in the infinite ris- wisdom, the crew, to pour a massive bucket of chum into the water. And that, you know, obviously that, that aroused these animals into predatory mode, which is not particularly sensible, mm. um, you might think. Great shots. But we had we had them particularly close. And there's, there's this moment where we're just back to back. And we're sort of using every bit of courage, teamwork, and our experience with shark just to keep these things away. But I think that's about as, as risky as you probably want to push things uh, with these wild animals and if we got bit we'd have probably deserved it because you, sh- you really shouldn't tempt an animal um in, in into into that situ- you know in that situation but what I, I think it shows is we are not we are not on the menu they are far more interested um in fish than they they, they are us and they really are a calm calculated predator and just a majestic majestic species yeah, absolutely. And a, a good point proven then in, in that show and the subsequent show as well, um, I imagine. I mean, you're here, so no dramas, <laughs> I yeah, assume. We, 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 we came up for a sequel just because um, uh, in the Pacific, uh, we decided to go back to the Pacific this time, a lot of airmen uh, found themselves, uh, they crashed into a shot down and found themselves at sea. And there are some amazing stories. Um, one group, one cr- crew, survived for 47 days on the water and they've been circled all the time by sharks wow we had so we had silkies around us and you know they really are not not a threat at all they're beautiful and they are smooth silky smooth you know actually spending time the more time you spend in the water underwater or, or, or on the surface snorkeling with with sharks or any marine species you start to to witness really interesting behavior one of the things i saw with with all with both sea species of sharks is there seems to be a relationship between sort of pair twos or threes of them. You know, they, 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 they work or move together. Um, and there's something I'd be interested to hear from scientists. You know, what is the relationship between um, different species of sharks, or particularly um, within a species, how they, how they socially communicate? And, you know, you had Andy Casagrande on the show who had the famous brothers, the great white sharks in Australia. You know, they clearly live together, they hunt together, and they have a relationship. And I think that's something that hasn't been much explored too much in the, in the science community about the social relationships that sharks have. We, there's so much we don't know. Am I right in saying you might be able to give us a little exclusive sneak peek on what's coming up next for you in terms of Shark Week and adventures? I've been training for years now as a cameraman. And um, so I've got my first gigs as an un- underwater cameraman coming up. Um, so one species we're going to look at is bull sharks. Um, and the other one we're going to look at is one of the last frontiers to film great white sharks. Um, there's a population, huge population of them in the Northwest Pacific Ocean. And I'm not going to give locations, but um, yeah, we do have a, a we do have an expedition going out to the Northwest Pacific to look for great whites and to document them. And there's so little research done into them 
But what, what we do know is it was off the coast of Taiwan that the largest great white shark ever measured, ever caught, was found. So these guys, this, this, this population is big. That was 6.2 meters. But they found many others that are that big. And they believe the great whites there grow quicker than any other spe uh, population of great whites around the world. So lo there's loads of really interesting factual scientific stuff that can be done in an adventurous format. And, you know, that's what I want to drive um, as I carry on, hopefully doing many more of these shows. That is so exciting. And uh, I love that you're going to be working with the bull sharks because it's kind of coming full circle for you. They got you into shark diving and sharks in general, and now you get to work with them. So I bet that's going to be quite a special experience. Yeah, I mean, I only thought about it once we, once we, um, we confirmed the expedition was going to happen, that this is the first time i have gone back to Florida. I would have um, dived, obviously, bull sharks there since I was, I think was, this is since 1994, which is, you know, making me sound <laughs> old, but it will be fascinating. And, you know, it was on a wreck dive we saw bull sharks, and they say that the aggregations where they're seeing a lot of bulls is around wreck so yeah this is this is going to be one, one cool but strange experience let's talk about we're both based in the uk uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the lovely sharks that we get here um so blue sharks i actually have a dive booked uh, in august which i'm hoping will go ahead have you had the pleasure of diving with the puppy dogs of the sea as we like to call them i do I, they are labradors i i with um you know, one of, one of my uh, diving heroes who I've worked with a couple of times on the on Discovery Channel is Mornay Hardenberg, who has shark explorers down in uh, Simonstown in South Africa. Had an ama amazing dive with those guys with about 30 blue sharks. One actually got stuck. They, they're, they're so curious. It got stuck between my regulator <laughs> and my face. <laughs> and then panicked and smashed me. It was like being hit by like, the right hook around the face. It, my mouth sort of exploded. They're just curious, you know, it's getting all, it's all, all the electro sensors, it's getting all this information, it's trying to work out, it certainly wasn't trying to attack me. One, one thing that really upset me to see though, as we were diving, you could see the long liner working, working the coast and it's take, they're pulling out all the blue sharks. But yes, Britain has great population off Ireland, off Cornwall. I'm going to be diving with those blue sharks that you're talking about in Cornwall in September, October, at the start of the tuna run. So is that your location you're going to? Amazing. No, I'm going to Plymouth um, and I'm not sure how easy it's going to be to, to find them. I don't know how responsive they're going to be. I'm, I've, I've not dived with them in the UK before. I've also been with shark explorers to see the blue sharks and they, they turned up very quickly in huge numbers, um, accompanied by three mako sharks. It was amazing. So the bar has been set. So I'm just really hoping that, uh, that they deliver. So we shall see. And on that topic, mako sharks are um, in the Atlantic. I mean, long thing mako sharks almost never seen. Uh, I, they are so they're crit almost critically endangered. But, but mako sharks in the Atlantic have been absolutely hammered by legal fishing. Britain, all European nations, um, China, African countries, all of us are responsible for hitting them. And, you know, the ICAT regulations, that there, 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 there should be no mako take whatsoever those are still being ignored by government so if the one thing you know anyone watching this if you want to get involved uh, in, in shark or marine conservation the one thing we can do is keep signing those petitions keep badgering whether it's your your mp any representative we need to regulate um the shark trade shark fin trade but particularly we need to protect mako sharks in the atlantic yes 100 percent. and you do a lot of work um with shark finning, don't you? And and particularly that campaign, you know, trying to raise awareness. So it's extraordinary that uh, shark fin soup is still served in the UK. It's it's extraordinary that you can take in and out of Britain and the EU twenty five kilos of shark fin per person. I mean that that isn't human consumption. That is that is that is commercial operation. You think twenty five kilos, fifty pounds. That's a hell of a lot of weight. Um, we just haven't clamped down on it. There's very very strong lobby in Portugal and Spain um, promoting and backing um, the shark fin trade or the shark trade in general. And what's really sad is that we have fantastic populations um, off the Azores um, of blue sharks, um, right where you know you see humpback whales and an, an amazing array of 
marine species that people don't think about it. So you don't have to go to the Bahamas. You don't have to go to South Africa to see these things. The work we do, and most of the work I'm involved in, is, is communication and education. But as you see, I'm wearing my Veterans for Wildlife um, T-shirt. I'm involved. I'm a director at the charity. We do a lot of land conservation, ranger training. Um, and what we're looking to do is to do more coastal protection training, um, supporting those that protect marine protected areas. And, you know, the, there is no doubt the leader in, in, in this battle against legal and illegal fishing is, is Sea Shepherd. And I was very fortunate recently at the Jackson Wild Media Conference in Jackson Hole last year, I had lunch with Paul Watson. Um, so you know, one of my one of my icons and sort of heroes to all of us. Yes. Fantastic time. We, we, we discussed shark conservation in depth. Did you learn a lot from that conversation? Because obviously he's been on the front lines many, many times. And I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I imagine that patrolling the oceans in some ways is a lot harder than patrolling on land. Working at sea mist makes everything harder. Mm. You know, everything, it, it deteriorates quicker. It's harder to navigate. It's just an austere environment. But also, you know, if you think about most of, most of our oceans are unregulated, the high seas, um, you know, people are getting away with illegal fishing. They're getting away with human rights abuses on the high seas. Paul Watson has been right at the frontier of that since the foundation of Greenpeace. And what's interesting, he, he was one of the founders of Greenpeace, fell out with them and started Sea Shepherd. You know, and he's devoted his life to saving whale and shark species. And he's actually been incredibly successful. If you look at, look at whale hunting, and it only really happens around the Faroe Islands and in Japan. And both of those business models are, are failing. But he's been the one um, putting pressure, Greenpeace as well, of course, but putting that pressure and keeping the issue in the headlines and putting himself in harm's way. So we, we know, and, and I know people get very frustrated with what they call eco-loons, eco-activists, but you've got to have those people that are taking risks, occasionally breaking the rules um, to raise these issues, um, to, to make a statement uh, and to encourage change. We have some questions of people that you have inspired uh, and things that people would like to know. So I'm going to I'm going to read them out for you. Brandy Dowdy Church uh, wants to know about your shark wrecked experience. Uh, was there anything in your world or military experience that really helped you make it as far as you did? You know, Paul and I um, really started talking about sort of our own family experiences um, from I think both of us had um, family members that served in the Second World War and just how hard they had, you know, whether, well, a grand, great grandfather was also on the Western Front. We talked about the sort of conditions that people used to live in. Um, then we also talked about shark, Paul's shark attack. And I think what we were able to do as was thinking, you know, when we were tired and cold, actually, you know, let's be honest, there is a safety support vessel about 150 metres away. That doesn't mean something bad can't happen to you. But, you know, life, it was never as bad as some of the situations our forefathers had found themselves involved. It wasn't as bad as some of the desperate times I've been in operations where I thought I was going to die in Afghanistan. And I have lost men in combat who are under my command. And, of course, Paul has suffered an incredibly traumatic experience losing limbs to a bull shark. You know, I think you, it's a case of when things are bad, you remind yourselves that things could be and have been a lot worse for other people. Um, and the situation isn't so bad. It is classic three-letter abbreviation, positive mental attitude, trying to find some hope or ray of light in a pretty in bad situations. And then another question she wanted to know, what's the coolest dive that you've ever been on? Military diving is fascinating because it's just extraordinary working at night. It's so challenging. Um, you know, I've spent five hours underwater. That's not the best dive I've had. Um, you know, and learning on rebreathers is, is, is fascinating. I, I think I, I would probably have to go back to, I think, the Barrier Reef um, on the, in the outer reef, the Coral Sea, because, you know, I've just done a, a shark dive with, with bronze whalers, um, and, you, and the coral's stunning, and the sharks are amazing. And when we came up, I was engrossed in um, this pinnacle, and as I looked round, there were minke whales. Oh, wow. I didn't expect there to be whales. And I, I think for the first time to see a whale of any sort, you know, a few metres away and just see, and they're one of the smaller, one of the smallest whales, but it's just absolutely fat, 
magnificent species. Uh, and they're so calm and elegant and graceful, unlike us sort of flapping around. <laughs> yeah. but it put, put, I think it put uh, us as humans in the water compared to this grace, graceful, uh, majestic animal. It put, it put it in perspective. So that's probably my, my favourite, still my favourite shark, well, my favourite diving experience. Hmm. And I'd love to talk to you a bit more about the military diving. I mean, you've just given us a little glimpse there. I don't know how much you can talk about it or not. The training, I mean, actually... If you can, if you can dive around some of the harbours, coasts, and in some of the currents around Britain, uh, you know, in January at night, you're going to be pretty competent at diving anywhere in the world. And where you're going, Plymouth has some extraordinary currents. Re- really, could be quite dangerous. Um, I just think what what I found really good about you know military diving is that you've got a lot of kit on you because you generally you're trying to achieve a task and you know, you've got a weapon strapped to your back and you and I can't at all go into details in any of this no. but you um you know operating at night is hard everyone knows a night dive is, is 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 confusing when you've got a lot of kit around you and you've got to have you've got to have you, you know a buddy with you you've got to communicate but when when you've got strong currents and bad visibility and it's about 4 or 5 degrees you know that is where your skills are really improved as a diver and I, I i probably learned more in sort of 40 to 50 military dives than i have learned in hundreds of bubble making dives in places like the bahamas um, or australia or any warm water because you know you, it it's to say it's life or death is that too strong no it's not people when 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 they're military diving do it, it's, it's a professional career people do do get hurt um because you you know you're working in extraordinarily um, dangerous circumstances, and, and what I would say the difference between um, professional diving um, and you know something like parachuting, um, which is also another sort of dangerous hobby that I do, and I've also done it professionally, is underwater everything seems fine most of the time. Everyone's like, you know, what's all this diving about? It's not particularly complex. It doesn't seem very dangerous. It's really the skill is in the preparation and then when something does go wrong you have such a small amount of time to rectify it especially if you're deep or it's at night and the skill comes of being in calm and having good procedures knowing exactly what to do because you have so little time to sort it out because that you know it will be game over if you don't get it right the difference with parachuting strangely is you generally have a reserve shoot you've probably got a bit more time to sort out a problem unless you're low to the ground um I think for me, the, the skill in diving is is comes with experience of being able to stay calm, because when things goes things go wrong, God, it escalates quickly underwater. Mm. And if you panic, you're not going to be thinking clearly, and then, as you say, you're going to lose that valuable time that you need. Gosh, that the worst is, thing fascinating. is entanglements. You know, it's so you, you start, you, you know, you find some you, uh, drift net or you've got ropes or anything like that. You know, any movement it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. Um, mm. Staying calm is the hardest thing to do, but the most important lesson of, 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 of diving. I could talk to you about that for hours. It really is fascinating. Next question from James Fontaine. Best places to shark dive in the UK? Well, right now, Scotland's seeing, seeing basking sharks. Uh, there's some great footage emerging from Ireland of basking sharks circling in a cove or in a cave. But if you want to see, you know, the most fun shark to dive with, I'd say, and you probably agree, is the, is the blue shark. There's some really good operations working off the coast of Cornwall. Um, and you can go out in the daytime. The water's relatively clear, warmish for the UK. Go and see the blue sharks. Yeah, I totally agree. They are so much fun. Any thoughts that you have? I and mean, with bearing in mind your background and all the amazing things that you've done, um, any words of advice for anyone who wants to get out there and do something interesting, do something exciting, especially when they've been stuck in the lockdown situation? I, I say this to people that this has been a difficult time and to, to motivate yourself when the economy is bad and you you've got the fear of coronavirus. My, my, my mantra has always been this, you know, no opportunity is going to come to you. No one's ever going to knock on the door and say, hi, do you want to go on an expedition? It just doesn't happen. It starts with researching something, but speaking to people, getting out there, going to conferences, or now logging online to conferences, trying to meet as many people as possible. 
don't be afraid to reach out to your to your heroes or scientists if you want to get into tv production companies go and make a film yourself you've just got to be active um, and you know you might knock on a hundred doors or send a hundred emails um, and, get, and, and get rejected so many times and you're going to get a lot of rejections rejections but you only need to be lucky once to get a break to get to the destination that you want to go to so you know get out be persistent accept failure accept rejection but just never stop taking one step after the other, knocking on the door and trying to speak to meet as many people as possible. And, and if you do that over time, you will um, find some really interesting adventures and people to do them with. Uh, and, and, I, and, I, and I'm still on that journey myself. And you say, you know, reach out and get in touch with people. So on that note, how can people get in touch with you, follow what you're up to? Yeah, please. I mean, if you have, you have questions, I'm always willing to support um, and, and especially anything to do with conservation. You know, please feel free to follow me on my Instagram and Twitter at J.A. Glancy and my James Glancy official on, on Facebook or my website, jamesglancy.com. And hopefully you're going to see um, some exciting uh, projects coming out uh, on Discovery Channel. Uh, and other UK channels shortly um, and I will definitely be posting updates to the extent I can on my social media um, from my next expedition in September. Good because I really want to know all about that as it's happening. <laughs> it sounds so exciting. Um, James thank you so much for joining me it's been a pleasure to chat with you and so inspiring so interesting and uh, I will certainly be following along and seeing what you get up to next. Gemma thank you for having me on you know I, I'm accompanied We've had some amazing guests, so that's a real privilege to be on. And uh, I look forward to seeing what your next shark adventure um, is going forward. Thank you. And uh, once again, thank you to everybody for watching at home. And uh, we will be in touch again for the next episode of Shark Talk. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.